So, good afternoon from Berlin. My name is Oliver Polakowski. I'm the co-founder and director of APATH for Europe. I'm very, very delighted to see so many of you participating in our very first event. So let me introduce PFEU as well as today's topic and speaker to you. PFEU was founded at the beginning of 2020 as a think tank focusing on the future of the European Union. And our team is exclusively comprised of young researchers. So we have PhD students, graduate students, young professionals, and we conduct research and policy advice. And we want to foster engagement for Europe through our debates and also through our talks as uh, the one today. So this web talk is part of our event series, Coffee Conversations COVID-19, in which we want to explore the impact of COVID-19 on a variety of EU policy areas. In five different web talks, experts from Europe and also from beyond Europe will share their thoughts on current policy challenges and how to navigate them. The topic of today is COVID-19 implications for financial stability. Together with Professor Dr. Paulus, former law professor at Humboldt University and off counsel at the law firm White and Case, who has advised the IMF and the World Bank previously, we want to explore the impact of national rescue loans, analyze and evaluate EU's reaction to the crisis, and discuss why the EU needs a resolvency procedure. So hello, Professor Paulus. Thank you for joining us today. It's my great <laughs> pleasure. Thank you. Before we talk about the reaction of the EU, let me start with the question on national rescue loans. So this will obviously help a lot of small and medium-sized companies, but also larger corporations to get through the crisis. But is there any negative side on that in the long term, especially? Um, fantastic question, first of all. And second, um, the real answer is yes, there are side effects. I mean, it's like a medication. It's always, nothing is just for the good. It has also some, some dangers and risk in it. And in the case of in some of, the, of, of, of this, this present crisis, I mean, it's an interesting to see that every crisis is some way, somehow connected with the, with the economy. And any crisis, be it that you have a flooding of uh, even of creeks, I mean, that is what we had a decade or so ago that in Saxonia in Germany, a couple, there was so much rainfall that even creeks were flooding and it destabilized an entire region with the consequence that the insolvency law had to be changed. So you see there is a direct implication between whatever happens and, and turns out to be crisis and insolvency law. Now, um, we all know, and unfortunately we all can recognize, we, we see that the present crisis leads to a very likely high number of insolvencies in the what is called real economy. That is to say the, the guy who's running a hotel, the guy who's running a restaurant, um, even the flight carriers, I mean Lufthansa is a wonderful example, they are burning every hour one million euro by not um, flying around and so on and so forth. So we have this, what I call the first jump of a triple jump. We have the um, insolvency in the real economy. Now, to the degree that the government, well, I should rather say governments, because that is a global phenomenon, that the global governments are trying to help, perfectly understandable, by giving loans or extensions of payments. They postpone another, how shall I put it, huge wave, I would say, of a future crisis. The future crisis is that at some point, such a loan needs to be repaid. And this time is, let's assume that this Corona crisis for the sake of simplicity lasts one year, and then you give uh, you receive a loan which you have to pay back in let's say one and a half years or you get an, an postponement of, of payment for also a year and then you have to pay what was not paid during this one year. 
And that, of course, implies that in those days, the guys who were and then will be again running a hotel need a double income, if at all. I mean, if it suffices, probably they need it more because things uh, will be more expensive after the crisis than they used to be. And they have to repay. They have to pay at all. And how do they do it? They take up loans and that increases the debt burden. And that leads to something which in my understanding is extremely dangerous because it's the follow up of the present real economy insolvency wave or jump. It's the risk of insolvency for financial institutions. Why is it so? Financial institutions are suffering already now um, from what is called non-performing loans. These are loans which are risk is, they are under certain risk that they don't get repaid. And this is such a dramatic problem, has already been such a dramatic problem in the last years, that the European Commission alone enacted minimum three directives, I think, um, three directives in order to reduce the, the amount of non-performing loans. At this point, I mentioned for the first time Italy, unfortunate Italy. They had already been suffering until January this year from the highest amount of non-performing loans something like 300 billion euros. And they were most eager to reduce this amount. And now in their situation, they are forced to get new funding, new loans, which increases the debt burden. And that means that the banks are um, even with, uh, burdened with an even higher amount of non-performing loans and that brings themselves the banks and we here we come to the third of the jumps of the triple jump that brings us in the vicinity of what is the highest danger of all because every bank insolvency is so dangerous because bank insolvency and sovereign insolvency are twin brothers siblings or sisters or however you want to call them they are closely interconnected. So if a bank goes bankrupt, the sovereign behind the bank is highly threatened to go bankrupt as well. And insofar, we are possibly, I mean, the worst of all cases, we are at the beginning of such a triple jump, at the end of which we have, I mean, I don't knock on wood, I would say, um, in which we might see a country like Italy go on bankrupt. And then if that would take place, if that would happen, we would long back for the times when Greece was um, going bankrupt because that was like uh, recreation uh, holidays or something like that. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I think we understood now this triple jump, um, but what has the EU's reaction been to, to this crisis now that is, that is on the horizon? I mean, EU finance ministers have agreed on a I think 500 billion immediate rescue plan, and they're also discussing an additional recovery fund. So I think the opinions on the details differ a bit, most importantly, whether this fund should be designed as a grant, so more a transfer of money, or a loan that needs to be paid back in the very end. And especially countries as our Germany, but also the Netherlands and um, the Nordic states, they are really strictly against joint debts in form of Corona bonds or Euro bonds. But isn't this crisis a bit different from previous crises in the way that it wasn't caused by the financial sector? It wasn't caused by um, governmental mismanagement. It was caused by a pandemic. So how should the EU react in light of European solidarity as well? Excellent question. And uh, you bring it down to the point. Um, forgive me, nevertheless, I will respond in different layers because the, um, the answer is not just a simple yes, we do or no, we don't. And 
irrespective of which celebrities are signing a letter and making it, making it public, that you have got to help Italy and stuff like that. So leaving this aside, um, let's begin with um, with um, yeah. Let's take the political the political no no. Let's begin with the, with the legal side. Um, the legal side is. Of course, we should we should give a grant. It should be unconditioned, and it should be the help for the Italians. Having for the reason that we are living in a project which you admirably enough, and congratulations for your initiative, that you have this think tank, which I find a fantastic idea. And it's exactly you who have to do that. You, you younger people, you have to work on that. And I'm grateful for those who are present that they are listening to an elderly man um, who can tell you, not that I was, I, I was born in 52, so I was born after the war. I was, I grew up in a situation in which I knew Europe and Europe was, uh, standing figure, so to speak. Um, but what I have realized is the horrible situation and about which I can also speak because I'm a historian and, and uh, because I'm highly interested in all these historical facts. When you're looking back at, at the European history, I mean, it's just, if you look at the last 600 years, it's a constant row of war uh, waging. So people were just killing. It was just killing. And when you're talking about killing, I mean, it's an abstract level when you're playing a computer game and you're shooting 20 or 100 or 1,000 people, and then you get shot, and then you have the relief that you have a second or a third or fourth life because you've earned all this. This is not true in reality. There you get killed or you get um, shot out your arm, your eyes, or whatsoever, or you get killed. Um, me being a father, I don't want my son to get killed in a, in a war. It's as simple as that. So we had in Europe, funnily enough, for literally centuries, as I said, 600 centuries minimum, probably 1,000 years, if not even longer, we had this experience that the neighbors were constantly waging war against each other. And it was the slightest incident happening that was enough reason to enter war you know, with the neighbor or with the two neighbors or with the neighbor of my neighbor, whosoever. So it, everything was welcome. And for the first time we have overcome that after 45 and we have brought by a legal instrument that is what I find so fascinating, being a lawyer myself. A contract, a treaty, made it possible what was impossible for millennia, centuries and millennia before. We have managed to get some peace into it. And if you look back at the last 70 years, and if you look at the disputes, which of course were going on, I mean, we don't agree with what the French say, the French don't agree with what the Italians say, and so on and so forth. But if you look at these reasons, and compared with the reasons which were sufficient to initiate a war 100, 200, 300 years ago, we would have had at least five, six, ten more wars in the last 70 years. But we didn't wage war because we have now a mechanism. So having said this, um, I find that the moralic uh, the ethical impetus must be, we need to help, we need to help um, Italy. But, and now I come to the political implication, if you allow me. Um, we come to the political Im implication. Number one, um, Germany, Netherlands, and the countries which you mentioned, they say, yes, of course, we have to help Netherlands. We do not disagree in the need of help. We disagree about the tools that we have to use. 
And Germany and the others are saying, well, we have established 10 years ago an instrument, or 12, uh, eight years ago, we have established an instrument which is designed exactly for this, for this purpose. And that is the European Stability Mechanism, the ESM. And they say they have a huge pot of something like 700 billion, and it should be done through the ESM. Italy is saying, no, we don't want from them, we want from you. Why? Because ESM is giving such a money, such money, not as a grant, but under conditions. And therefore, in conditions, I mean, that is the, the, the Troika, not the Troika, but um, European officials, and some of them individuals might be even Germans, are coming to Rome and they're saying, you guys, you have got to do this. And that is what the Italians do not want. And that is what exactly in Italy, a person like Salvini is using that look at these Germans, they want to suppress us, they want to instrumentalize the conditionality of the ESM in order to um, make us their slaves. Now, I mean, that is fully understood to the best of my knowledge here by the people in the government, including Angela Merkel. But they have a similar pressure. If they are giving a grant, it's the RFD, which is coming right on the spot and saying, why aren't we helping them? Why aren't we improving the hospitals here in, in the region which is in dire need of, of what have you? So you have immediately the national narrowing down of the problems. I mean, skipping completely the broader picture of the need of a unified Europe in the modern world. And so that brings you into a combination of horrible, of a horrible mixture. And under these circumstances, it's quite helpful. I hope that it's quite helpful what Ursula von der Leyen made as a proposal a couple of days ago when she said, okay, if not ESM, if not national, then why don't you national state increase your budget at the commission and we then as a commission um, do uh, give the help. That is, in my understanding, the best possible uh, solution because then the help would come from Europe and that is exactly where it should come from. Okay, so we don't need joint uh, bonds, for example, joint debts. I mean, I'm probably a little bit too much of a German, even though I'm, I'm not entirely happy with that. Um, the danger is always that if you, if you give such a grant because of the extraordinary circumstances of the moment, you are setting a precedent. And, and that makes it so, so, so difficult and so problematic. On the other side, I'm not so German that I would agree with um, the, the German proposal and then the Dutch proposal to do it through the ESM because that is typical German. You didn't behave well. You didn't do your, your job in keeping, in the household keeping. You have spent too much and so on. I mean, it's a usual prejudice and maybe it's also some true in it. Um, it's the usual stuff. We always, we are ready to help, but we want to be the superior master and tell you, you get it, but you behave in the future. And that is not done in, the, in these circumstances. Okay, yeah, thank you so much. I think uh, I understood this. We will also probably see another debt crisis, no matter what they will decide now, no matter what rescue instruments they will, they will impose. Um, you personally have been calling for a very long time already for something called a resolvency procedure. Could you explain to our audience what that means, what your model would look like, and also why it would maybe help us in that crisis, but also in previous crises or future crises? Yeah. Um, first of all, I, it's hard to tell you how, how grateful I am that you are asking me, me this question. Because as you indicated, I'm, I'm advocating it for something now like 20 years. 
and whenever a crisis pops up, I'm asked, and once the crisis is over, I'm, I'm fucked up. So you give me the chance, you give me the audience to, to present it again. Um, it's, as a matter of fact, it's, um, it's a sort of, of simple equation. And for those in the audience who are lawyers or who are studying law, they will probably understand better than others that there is a huge advantage of having a procedure, a legal procedure. Why is it so? Because it structures a chaotic situation. When you have um, sovereign collapsing, those who are listening, they might remember Argentina. They are they quite certainly remember the situation in Greece 10 years ago. And they might have some insights also about the situation that we have right now in Venezuela, which is the most disastrous of all, or Lebanon, or I mean, there are dozens of countries which are right now in the in insolvency uh, under the under the, the commercial insolvency um, uh, metaphors. So if you have, and that is the simple equation, provide um, a structured, an orderly procedure, which gives guidance of what is to be done. It's not a golden solution, don't get me wrong. So it's not that after, once you have established it, um, we have paradise on earth. No, 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 we don't have. We will have bitter fights um, among creditors and debtor and so on and so forth, but it will be structured and it will be depoliticized. And that is where I have really difficulties to understand and to grapple why politicians are so negative to the idea. I remind you of the situation that we had in Greece 10 years ago. It was quite on the spot that the big, big, big enemy in Greece and further on in the Mediterranean countries, the big, big enemy has been Angela Merkel and Schäuble. It was immediately personalized. It was all immediately politicized. And if you have instead a procedure where there is an institution, which I call Resolvency Forum, there are seven or nine people to be elected from a broader pool of a very diversified, um, but um, a pool of people of, of high expertise, not necessarily lawyers, because it's less a legal question than a political and economic and social and what have you question. It's an, a highly complex um, problem. If you have these sort of neutral persons, they are likely to have a completely different standing than when Merkel or Schäuble or whoever is in charge are saying something. So, and coming back to the need for a structured procedure, imagine, imagine just the situation. You are the finance minister of, no, I don't make you to the finance minister of Italy. I make you the finance minister of any country. Let's say, no, okay, let's take the Lebanon. You are the finance minister of Lebanon. And then you recognize, oops, the, the income of my country is not the best one. I can't increase the taxes because the population is already so poor that wouldn't help at all and the creditors are pressing. So at some point you have to say and to decide, gosh, from this moment on, I can't, I can't um, pay back my creditors. Now, what are you going to do in such a situation? You have no help. Forgive me, I, I, I give you a, a, a cheap, sort of cheap example. Um, when you're going to Ikea and you buy a shelf, 
you, of course, if you don't have the, the, the piece of paper with the instruction on it, you go back to IKEA and say, well, I need it because I, I have to build this together and, and I can't do it without help. I mean, I did it a couple of times and therefore I did this is this example of it. My son is even telling me that um, even if I have the instructions, I cannot build it together, but that's another story. So, but now put yourself in the shoes of a finance minister. I mean, it's a little bit different, the task that you have to mount as a finance minister to bring your country back into, into calmer uh, water, then to, to build together a, a shelf. And there's nothing, not a single indication of what you have got to do. And for that reason, the entire situation which it exists now is always ad hoc. And it's a question of, it's a power game. It's an extreme power game. So if, if you have Greece, for instance, which is seen as not so powerful and not so influential, you have almost naturally the first thing that Tsipras did when he was elected, he goes to Moscow in order to show that there is someone else who is ready to help. And so on and so forth. So uh, what I'm trying to say is, is the situation that we have is a disaster because it's open to, to influences which have, which have nothing to do with the solution, but which are geopolitical. So under these circumstances, I would say it's extremely helpful to have a procedure. And the latest proposal that I have um, made and uh, which I'm advocating already for a couple of years is um, because the traditional way nowadays of, of raising money for a sovereign is to go to the capital market and to do it on a contractual basis. So when you go to the capital market, you, you take up, you, you're borrowing money from the population, wherever that population is. And it has different names, but in the end of the day, it's a loan contract. So you're taking up a loan. And for that reason, since the dominant um, money funding instrument is a contract. I follow what is called an contextual approach. I'm advocating that um, each contract, indenture contract or whatsoever, should include an additional clause which says in case of, and that, that needs to be defined, of a sovereign default, of um, the need of restructuring, then the borrower, the sovereign, is allowed to trigger the procedure. So that would be a contractual clause. The second one, you would need uh, to have such a resolvency um, forum, as I said. My proposal is that you establish that at the, um, at the arbitration court, uh, standing arbitration court in The Hague because that's a neutral institution. It must not be some, uh, somewhere in Paris, somewhere in, in Berlin or, or um, in one of the member states. It should be something which is, is a separate um, uh, unit. So in there, you are establishing a pool of potential forum members or judges or however you want to call them, and you need a president. And then you are, as a country, as the country X or Greece 10 years ago, if we had had it at that time, they would go to the, to the president and hand in a plan how they think that uh, their, their country could be restructured, the debts could be restructured. And that is a procedure that we know from commercial insolvency law and many of those things are adapted by them by this proceeding. So then um, this president is uh, setting up the, the standing panel of let's say seven or nine people. And they are from now on the guys who are supervising the procedure. And the procedure as such is just an invitation to negotiation. The debtor is discussing with the creditors the plan, the initial plan which has been proposed. And the creditors of course are saying, are you crazy? You want me to have an, uh, to accept a haircut of, of 50%. I, if at all, I uh, agree to a haircut of 30%. The other carriers are saying this. So the bargaining is going on. And then at some, some point of time, let's say after a year or after one and a half years, there comes a cut. 
And then there is the voting on this. And of course, the debtor has to concede and to make a couple of concessions. The creditors have to make a couple of concessions. And then, um, depending on the majority requirements, of course, it's a, a qualified majority, the plan is accepted. And then there is not only a reduction of the debt, but also obligations imposed on the debtor. For instance, to improve the tax collection system to I don't know what, and whatever the conditions are that the, the um, creditors have voted for, and that is it. Okay, um, but we don't have that system yet. Um, and I don't know, I think you also were also asked why don't we have that, and I think it has actually something to do with power play and that governments don't want to put their own um, power to, to a neutral body. But one of our attendees um, actually made a good point and asked, but what about the democratic um, um, control of those institutions? If you place neutral experts in, in such, a, such a body, where, where's the democratic control then? It's a fully, uh, perfectly understandable question. Um, as a matter of fact, um, right next to me, there is one dissertation dealing with exactly this issue. Um, however, it is having myself experienced a couple of those crises. I've been to a certain degree involved in, in Argentina uh, 19 years ago. Not in the present, they are, they are running into the next one. Um, but looking at the situation there, you can, if, if, if you take that situation as it has been and, and as it uses to be, and that is the comparator, then you can, in those circumstances, forget about many of the de democratic rights. I mean, it is hard, in my present understanding, it's extremely hard to square two things, two circles, um, and then to bring together a chaotic situation in which your democratic rights are anyway, they're down to zero. I mean, you still can vote, of course, and you can, you can utter your opinion and, and what have you, of course. I mean, there's no restriction on that. But um, the situation is anyway, it, it, it's horrible. And the Troika, I mean, that is the comparator on, in reality. What do you prefer? The Troika, which is a power game, which ignores these democratic uh, rights as well? Or do you want to have a regulated proceeding? You are, in the, and once again, I'm, 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 not, I'm not even thinking of ridiculing this question. It's an extremely important question, but it touches upon this extremely difficult and hard to answer and hard, even harder to solve situation that you are in a very, very critical situation in which, well, yeah, the rights that we enjoy. And I assume that all the younger people who are attending this have never experienced, me, including me. I mean, as, as I said in the beginning, I'm in the extremely privileged situation, born in 52. I never went through war times. Um, and it is, I mean, these situations, I always lived in the, in, in, in the Bundesrepublik. I was happy enough that I was born after our own, our German insolvency. I mean, maybe I, you allow me to remind the audience that in the last century, Germany was twice bankrupt. And it's only the, the allies that we owe this fantastic life that we enjoy in our country with all the, the um, rage and with all the, the um, irregularities and what have you and all the complaints that we are raising, we are living in a fantastic surrounding and thanks to the help of creditors. I mean, that is the so-called Londoner Schuldenabkommen, which, which rescued us. And the time before was disastrous. It was a catastrophe. And these 
these democratic rights that we have, you guys, including me, we all, we have to fight for that we keep them, but we must be aware that under certain circumstances, things are not as easily done as they are in times when we have peace and no problems uh, except luxury problems like I don't know what, that the weather is too hot or too cold or what have you. So forgive me for making another statement in this context. It shall indicate you how serious I take this question. I've just finished this morning to read a book um, about a Jew in the ghetto in Poland a couple of months before the end of the war. And it makes you humble when you read this. And it makes you aware on what extremely high level we are complaining today. I mean, when we are, for, for instance, saying today in the corona crisis, how long can we bear this? In my understanding, and having read this book, it's the completely wrong question. I mean, ask as a Jew in the ghetto, ask the Nazis around you, I can bear this only one more week. I mean, that is the comparator that we have to take into account. Apologies, that got a little bit personal. We have other questions, do we? Yeah, we do. First of all, thank you so much for, for your wonderful and interesting answers and shedding some light on all the financial issues surrounding this crisis, but also now addressing other points. Um, I think that we have all to keep keep in mind when, when we're living in those hard times. And we actually have a lot of other questions. I'm going to take a look at the Q&A tab, start with that. I uh, see some others were in the chat as well. Please use the Q&A tab um, as this is a bit easier for us to coordinate. So the first question that I see is um, what economic policy actions have countries already to address this crisis? So what what instruments do we already have before we're talking about new instruments? Yeah. Um, I mean, I'm showered in, in the last weeks, I was showered by, by reports from all sorts of countries, including, including even Venezuela and, and, and um, Japan. Um, the legislators are right now extremely active and the range of where they are acting is of course, from insolvency law, mm. going over contract law. I mean, frustration of contract is a huge issue in the moment. And it going to tax law, going to um, all sorts and company law. I mean, things like that, that uh, it's a side product, so to speak. And that is likely to last that an online um, gathering or for companies will be made uh, uh, or is already being made possible and stuff like that. So it is, it's, it's pretty much like as if they are going through the entire field of law or fields of law in order to screen what needs to be adjusted and what uh, needs to be changed. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Um, the second question is a very interesting question, as I think. Um, talking about the European Central Bank, um, we're probably aware that they have started a program of buying securities amounting to 1.1 trillion euros already. Um, isn't that actually enough to finance the fiscal deficits of member states? So, I mean, they're less dependent on financial markets than they have been during the euro crisis, for example. They, they had to um, buy offer their bonds on the financial market, this time the ECB jumps in from the very beginning. Isn't that enough? Uh, I love this question. It's fantastic. Yeah, the role of the ECB. Um, no, it's not enough. Unfortunately, it's not enough. And one of the reasons is, I mean, it's a multiplicity of, of a reason, but the main reason that I want to pick out right now is um, the pre-existing amount of debts in this world is probably higher than the 1.3 trillion. I don't have the exact figures right now in front of me, but you can check it. Um, look at in, in, under Google at Global Debt Clock. Then you will see what the debt amount of the entire globe is and uh, of each particular country. And if you look at this 
astonishing um, figure, which I can't even spell because I don't know where the trillions begin, where the billions uh, end and so on and so forth. So it's a huge number. Look at this number and be aware that this is the wrong number because the real amount of debt is even higher than that one. There are hidden debts. The hidden debts play an enormous role in the households. So given this, um, we have to do with something which is the negative impact of the medication. Again, the medication example. When medication turns to poison, um, the, there is something, I can't go deeper into it, but I want to mention it here. There's an enormous danger with this debt amount, which is almost never addressed publicly. And if you search for it in Google, I did it once, I found only a quotation of myself. Um, they have introduced on the capital market, the, the rumor has it that it was introduced by the, by the Wall Street people, something like 20 years ago. They call it the weaponization of financial instruments. Weaponization of financial instruments means nothing less than that the law instrument, the legality of the law is used as a military goal or as a military tool, even better. So what do you want to achieve with military or with the weaponization you want to, to get? Well, for instance, you want to enter a land, a foreign land. And in this context, Mr. Polakowski, do we have the time? Can, can I elaborate this a little bit? Will for me, yeah, it's definitely fine. We have the time and um, for the use, as we officially said, it runs until 45, um, uh, but it's all obviously welcome to stay a bit longer. Thank you very much. So um, I nevertheless try to, to, to be brief. Um, I give you an example of, of it, it's China, but it's not only China. I mean, other countries, I'm sure, are doing this as well. I just happen to know this Chinese example. They had a loan um, given out to Sri Lanka and Sri Lanka, bought, no, no, has built a port in the south of the country, which was completely unnecessary, but nevertheless, the head of government wanted to have the port. And once the port was finished, it turned out that it was a big failure because there's no economic income connected with this port. And that made it troublesome to pay back the Chinese loan. The Chinese, when they were approached by this governor, by this head of government, saying, oh, I have problems to pay back. They said, well, it's no problem at all. The reason why they said it is they have now free, for free, for the next 99 years, this port, plus a strip of 15 miles around this port, they have free access to that. And the consequence, the geopolitical consequence of that is that India all of a sudden is extremely nervous because they have the Chinese anyway in the north of the country now they have it also in the south. Now have a look at Venezuela. I understand that the Americans are nervous with what is going on in Venezuela because Venezuela is poor like hell and whatever income they have or will have is from, from oil exploitation. Most of that is already pledged to the Chinese because Chinese are by far the greatest, the biggest creditor of them. Now imagine the situation or the same solution of the Sri Lanka case and transfer it to Venezuela. Then all of a sudden you have the Chinese there. I mean, it's part of the, of the um, Belt and Road, Belt Road uh, project. Um, so you can find it fantastic, but it's, there's a certain danger in it. Yeah, do you think it's likely that they will expand their bailouts to, to European countries as well? I mean, they have to some extent already done that in Italy or in Greece, but will we see more now in light of the current crisis? I mean, I learned only yesterday that the, the what is it, in Heinsberg, in this region in West Germany, where we have the highest rate of corona uh, uh, infected people, um, he had asked for Chinese help. I mean, that is 
that is commonly done. Yes, I expect this to be more often and the Chinese are willing and ready. Of course, I mean, if we were in their position, we would do the same. Um, they are offering, they are saying, I can help you. Mm, okay, yeah, I think that's what, what most people fearing as, as well. Um, we have one other question, or we have a couple of other questions, but the first one, what are, in your view, the safeguards against a new bank crisis? So qualitative easing of collateral standards by the ECB already happened. Quantitative easing, lower interest rates, are they already at a lower bound? Or easing of European standards for e equity capital for banks, use of the single resolution fund and the bail-in tool or fiscal backstop for the single resolution bond. European deposit insurance uh, use a new, a lot of tools that are well, um, used. An expert is asking a non-expert, but um, I can tell you, <laughs> I've just finished another dissertation, which is here right next to me, um, on bail-in, on the bail-in instrument. And the conclusion very convincingly is it doesn't work. And this, coincides with what I have heard from uh, Dr. Koenig. She is the head of the uh, European Restructuring Mechanism, no, not, not ESM, of the oh, single, single Restructuring, SRM uh, Mechanism. Uh, bank, uh, you know what I mean. So she said, uh, I, I met her once on a, on a conference, she just said she has no idea how to apply this, the, this statute. So um, I'm afraid I mean, I'm, I'm conservative, I'm insofar, well, yeah, I'm let, let me be careful. Insofar, I'm very conservative. I'm a fond of, of a healthy ratio of, of equity and, and capital to borrowed. Um, so raising, you see it in, in, in the Mittelstand, in the German Mittelstand, those who are the most resilient ones, they happen to have an uh, equity ratio of 40% plus. And there was recently I read in, in, in a research project on that. It's interesting, um, it helps you. I mean, it's, it's, it's old fashioned. It's not so sexy as the modern economists, uh, economists are teaching at university and are writing articles about that you need no equity at all. You make out of nothing, you make a fortune. I mean, it's like like um, this Perpetuum mobile. People are looking forever, for ages, for the Perpetuum mobile, and it doesn't work. Um, so you can't create something from nothing. And therefore, I mean, it's a, a simp very simplistic, too simplistic question to such a, a fine and 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 a serious question. And I do apologize for this vague answer, but um, we should do a seminar on that. Um, so in brief, it's exactly just that what, what comes to my mind. This, we, we had decades of, of the dominance of the, of the economists and they are working in my understanding a little bit too much on assumptions. Let's assume. Okay, um, we have time for one other question, I would say. And I would like to ask a question of a user that refers to the future and a little outlook. So I would like you to, to say and elaborate a bit more what you think will happen. We have discussed now a lot what would be appropriate to happen, what's the right way, um, resolvency procedures and so on. But what do you think will happen now? First of all, um, and this is where I come back to the beginning of our talk of your presentation of your wonderful think tank. Um, I'm putting a lot of trust on you young people. And I urge you, once it's possible again, travel around and, and accept and invite people from abroad to come here. I mean, you are in... It, 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 it's indicative what I've experienced in, in England. There is a friend of mine who is um, living in a house in London in the first floor 
in the ground floor, his kids are living. In the second floor, his parents are, are um, living. And the, his kids are not any longer talking with their grandparents. Why not? Because the grandparents almost never traveling around. They voted for Brexit. And the kids traveling around failed to vote. And now they are the ones who are put into the borders which the grandparents have imposed on them. The grandparents have, had grown up with these borders and therefore they are used to it. You kids, you shouldn't get used to the, to, to the borders. That is my primary message. The um, second part of the answer is um, we will not get a resolvency proceeding. There will be a discussion again. Maybe I'm again invited to TV uh, to shows or whatsoever, but this is nothing for eternity. That is just for the moment. And there will be again a political solution. And then it depends on, on yeah, the, as a matter of fact, um, how credit worthy, how reliable is the demonstration of solidarity? And that is something which is extremely hard to show and to perform. We have in those 600, 800,000 years of European history never, never worked on showing solidarities because we have waged war. And it's now the time that we have learned. And it's once again, it's your generation. You are the first. I mean, to a certain degree, I was it as well. But it's even more so you guys who have to, to practice solidarity, to learn and to practice solidarity. Thank you so much, Professor Paulus, for that uh, positive outlook and also for your call for the younger generation to get active, to be part of discussions. That's what we're doing here, what we're trying to achieve to get young people together, but also to listen to experts that have been uh, living a bit longer than we have and also have a bit more experience. So thank you so much for answering all those questions on financial issues uh, around the crisis. And thank you so much for our audience to join this uh, very, very first digital event of PFEU. We're looking forward to seeing you on another webinar. The next one will be on Thursday together with Friederike Röder on the EU's global response to COVID-19. And for now, we wish you all um, a very great rest of the day and um, see you soon. Thank you so much for joining and today. And stay healthy. Stay healthy. Bye-bye. Everyone, goodbye. Thank you so much for joining.